Hey there fellow aquaphiles, I am Pruitt and this is Jim Davis. And in an effort to curry favor with our Aquaman fans, we will discuss Namor no more. And instead, go back to that first lesson we learned from our first case of crabs. Under the sea, darling, it's better down where it's wetter. Take it from the Tritons. We're discussing them on WebDM. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Nerdarchy's Out of the Box Encounters, live on Kickstarter. The Nerdarchists were some of the first YouTubers to reach out and contact us when we got started. We've played D&D with them and they know what makes for a fun RPG session. Out of the Box Encounters has all kinds of options for integrating the encounters into your campaign and giving you all the information you need to anticipate your players' questions. Go check them out, link here and in the description. And stay nerdy! Okay, Jim, let us plunge the depths of the oceans. Embrace the deep cold. And as it embraces us. We can't escape. You can't you, escape. I mean, you gotta swim it. speed, but Tritons. Perhaps it's research or fortuitous or whatever, but yeah. we did watch Aquaman recently. We did watch Aquaman recently, and I loved it. Insane exposition at every turn, but the epic action adventure that happens underwater. That's pretty tasty. It's inspirational, right? I started thinking about this, and not just Tritons in general, but I'll, I'll go on a big tangent for a minute before All we right, jump into it. it. Yeah, I read a lot of uh, uh, Keith Baker's blog, Eberron uh, creator. He has a you know, blog where he talks about all the different D&D subjects and stuff. And one of them uh, was a digression on the undersea empires of Eberron and how Kuatoa and Sogwin and, and Triton and Merfolk all have these like world world-spanning undersea empires. One of the things that he always wanted to do is like write a book or some kind of supplement that was it takes place entirely underneath the waves and like details the, you know, how these various empires and countries have clashed and had their own history and everything. And like the only other setting that I have seen that takes undersea civilizations as seriously as like this is a thing that exists in the world it, it influences the creatures on or the cultures on land and vice versa and whatever is um the wilder lands of high fantasy setting which has um tritons and merfolk in it and one of the cities there the veridistan the city state of the world emperor i think is like the world emperor there has subjugated the tritons of dolphin bay or whatever it is and like keeps their emissaries locked in tanks in his throne room that he sort of like as trophies of conquest and goes around and knocks on the glass right. every day. <laughs> I like it because it is, you know, we focus so much on the surface, right? The, you know, there's either, you know, what's going on in the human kingdoms and the elven realms and the dwarf holds and the like, and maybe you venture underground into the subterranean world of the Underdark, but so rarely do you go underneath the waves and realize that there is a whole fantasy world down here too. Yeah. They've got you know threats and uh, monsters and civilizations and magic and why wouldn't they also trade with the surface? Why wouldn't they also talk and, and communicate and be integrated? It seems to me that some smart wizards would uh, do some dealings with those that could get access to sweet sweet pearls. Sweet sweet pearls and all those special ingredients that are underwater and you know like what kind of spells can you cast with minerals from an undersea volcanic vent? What kind of fireball would you cast from uh, underwater, like a back, like a, what would it be, like a, some kind of weird mantle ray guano or? Oh, yeah, or you're, you're like powdered coral or something yeah. like that. I, yeah, I think probably like it's a fireball that just like flash boils water and creates like this, uh, maybe it obscures vision for a minute as it like creates a bunch of bubbles and and it uh, and the like, but it like flash boils uh, the whole thing, maybe scalds a little, you. A little less damage and like for another like round or two, it's almost like a fog cloud. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, something like that as they all sort of dissipate and everything. Tritons would be one of those people. That's a way, way uh, hard, uh, hard segue there. Sometimes you gotta have the undertow rip you right back. The riptide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> back on the track. Tritons would obviously be a part of this world. I like the sort of the backstory of the Tritons is, as from the, the elemental plane of water. And it, to me, it like reminds me of, say, the Aboliths who originate from the plane of water. And, and at least in terms of like the Tritons uh, backstory in Folos, it suggests that there's a whole host of aquatic monsters that came to the prime material from the plane of water. So they're like invasive species into these uh, prime worlds and like the Tritons follow them. They're, you know, they, have, they feel like some sort of responsibility for this is because they were the guardians of it or something. I'm, I don't even know if this is how this relates to like other <laughs> D&D lore for Tritons, but it's, it's an interesting kind of take because it, 
it suggests number one that your the oceans of your world are just as dangerous just as fantastical just as wondrous as the other places of it but also that um somewhere down there are portals to the elemental planes that things can get through it's only by these <laughs> beings these people who have decided that this is their responsibility that whatever comes through those portals doesn't take over the world that just is cool to me yeah you know, i just i love that this is silent war under the waves to keep the world safe it's very uh, dr strange like like <laughs> defending us from some existential threat whether it's space but in in this case like water the plane of water but yeah. love the idea of these civilizations kind of springing up around these portals that maybe brought their ancestors here yeah and they find oh we're in a new land yeah uh, and we could go back mm -hmm. but you know we found some bounty we found some purpose here and oh shit our enemies are coming through now yeah so yeah we got to put a cap on this thing and guard it it works for like sort of a baseline triton and if you're playing one that's just um you know a, a emissary of their uh, of their people or like somebody just sort of like wandered up on land and was like well what's this world all about or something like that you can lean into that we're the silent protectors kind mm -hmm. of archetype but i also think tritons work well as just like a reskinned just they're an aquatic excuse me an aquatic humanoid you know, they can be reskinned in, in a variety of different ways to get mutant fish people or, you know, uh, Kevin Costner. Or, right, Kevin Costner. <laughs> Maybe they are the result of like magical evolution uh, or something like that. Humans that, uh, you know, changed themselves permanently in order to be able to operate uh, better under the water. Um, you could see something like, you know, returning to Eberron, someone from like the Lazar principalities. I know in Forgotten Realms, there's those islands off the Sword Coast where the the people there sort of worship a kraken it's like basically uh you know shadows over innsmouth the you know they all become deep ones uh, as they get older the aquatic heritage of their uh ancestors becomes more and more apparent and yeah. you know, maybe that could be represented by triton i like them for that reason the ocean is a terrible and wondrous place yeah. and it's full of bizarre weird alien creatures and that's just like our own oceans <laughs> they inspire and have so much going on in them that it seems like a shame to not develop them for your own world and like find a place for triton they're champions yes they're Wait. they're they're nobles they've got they got an elf vibe you know yeah, they, they do have like that kind of like better than a little bit um that haughtiness to them we have this div um, i would wouldn't say divine purpose but we have this purpose of, of protection and, uh -huh. and whatever and uh, generally, they're kind of ignorant of the surface. So, th taking all that kind of into account, what are some good concepts? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, like I can tell you one that uh, I have yeah. because I literally made it last night for <laughs> your upcoming underwater game. Yes, right. after watching that's Aquaman, true, that's true. I do have. I am prepping for an underwater uh, uh, game. <laughs> but after watching Aquaman, I'm like, come on, I got to do a noble. Uh -huh. I'm gonna do a warlock hex blade. Sure. Uh -huh. And we get one on common items. So I'm taking that trident of fish command, baby. <laughs> That's my hex blade. That's the thing that is calling that has called to me. And so uh, I can't wait to play it because, you know, it, just the stat boosts alone. It's it really it's right there for a warlock. It's there for a lot of a lot of classes. I like them as paladins, right? Like I think they fit paladins really well. Yeah. Uh, you could do devotion. You could do ancients. But, uh, yeah, oath of ancients, definitely. I could even see, you know, depending on how you structure their, uh, you know, their society and, and how uh, advanced your, you know, undersea civilizations are, they could be like oath of crown, something like mm -hmm. that. Well, but, or if they're how aggressive they are, like a yeah. certain uh, king, uh, they sure. could be <laughs> a oath of conquest. Oh yeah. I mean, they if they be believe that the ocean should rule. I mean, there is that as well, right? Like. Like they've got that uh the arrogance and sort of haughtiness can be translated into you know well yeah we don't know anything about the surface world it, like why would we need to you yeah. know like it's just gonna get swallowed up one day <laughs> by the enough. ocean i know enough it doesn't have enough water you can't see that right like if you're a it, it, especially if you don't ha buy into the planar origins for them and they are yeah. sort of like a, a an indigenous aquatic people to your world and they may see themselves as the first intelligent peoples because all life comes from the sea they are some of the first ones to develop civilization like screw those dragons and elves like you guys needed gods to do that right like you had to have gods come down and help you out we did this ourselves we scraped ourselves <laughs> out of the muck of the seas and formed ourselves so you could feel like that and in that sense you know they would have kind of a um, you know, the rest of the world belongs to us because it's, we are the first mm -hmm. uh, sort of attitude about uh, the surface or even other undersea uh, uh, peoples. We got good paladins there. 
warlocks as well, storm sorcerers, right? Oh. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you represent storm sorcerers. Yeah, no, it'd be nice and tasty, but you, even if you're just a fighter, yeah, um, you, you're a fighter that leads. I mean, you, sure. you, you know, you're gonna have at least a little, little bump to charisma. It works so well. Anytime you can get con mm -hmm. and a, a physical, another physical stat, yeah. And a mental stat. I mean, like anything that gets three bumps. I, I is... Just like that. I, yeah, I, I like the three plus ones, and I think that yeah. it'd be it'd be interesting to see more of the player race options go that route. I really kind of see it for hobgoblins. You know, like hobgoblins have that weird sort of like con int, but you could easily do strength con int. You know, yeah. and and just plus one to each of those. So I like that. I, and the rest of their abilities kind of like tie in to make uh, a, a character that has a strong theme uh, and is also like, you might not think about it. You might not, you might think like, ah, oh, the ability to operate independently underwater and, and have all these ability, these aquatic abilities, like it's not gonna matter. It's not gonna come up. And yet almost every time that I have included a water hazard in a dungeon, in an environment, something where it's like, you've got to go underwater, you've got to navigate say an underground river, or there's a, a subterranean lake, or you got to cross this uh, body of water for something. Like it's always a challenge. It's always one of those things where players are like, oh shit, like no, I don't, I know I don't have the water breathing ritual because I never use it. The vigilante game that I was in, mm -hmm near the beginning when we were still like fifth, fourth, fifth, sixth level, yeah. around that time, there was a big part that was all underwater. We were fighting some hogwin. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a little, some tritons in there, but there were some dire sharks mm -hmm. uh, that we had to fight. But luckily we did have a druid yeah. that could cast water breathing. Right. But of course they had sorcerers and sometimes in the middle of fights and things, uh, at least uh, there was a couple times we had underwater things. And at one point it was like, yeah, they're casting to spell on our water breath. And, and you know, like, you really have to think about these things and think them through. It adds a fun challenge to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, if you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about it. And I consider being able to operate independently underwater to be one of those benchmarks of an adventurer yeah. that by the time they get to say tier three or whatever, tier two or tier three, where I kind of expect, yeah, you guys are adventurers. You need to have some recourse, even if it is magic and, and can be taken away from you. So like having a creature where it's like, I got a swim speed, I'm amphibious. Plus I can talk, I can communicate, you know, sort of rudimentary ideas to the life that we're gonna find down here. And I'm and I can go anywhere down here. It doesn't matter how cold it is, doesn't matter how deep it is, I'm gonna be fine. Um, and in that sense, you've got a, a more versatile character who is uh, competent in a variety of environments and that appeals to me strongly. And in that sense, I'll take that for almost any character concept. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's a totem barbarian where it's like, I'm a shark totem triton, <laughs> you know, and I've just reskinned, say, uh, the wolf abilities or something like that. I'm a whale totem uh, triton, and that's where the bear comes from. Or even just make up others, you know, octopus. Uh, you, you know, totem uh, barbarian. Good, maybe really gets, good at grappling. I was gonna say, maybe that's the, your two weapon fighter barbarian or good at grappling, something yeah, like yeah. that. Giant squid <laughs> totem. Kraken totem. <laughs> Kraken totem. Or it's like a ranger, right? Beast companion ranger. Uh, uh, Sonar with a dolphin. Yeah, a dolphin, shark, orca, or octopus, or any other number of weird creatures that you might want to have. The more I talk about it, the more I want to have an entire campaign that takes place underwater just because these are I'm going to do a rundown for you guys. Kuatoa, Merfolk, Marrow, Sogwin, Lokatha, which are another kind of uh, sea devil type uh, monster from prior editions. Tritons, sea elves, and some types of lizard folk. You can easily see like sea iguanas or something like that as being part of this world. Mm -hmm. And like that is as... Even Yonti? Yonti, like you could, right? You could have like more like water moccasins, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, all you have to do is give them, you know, amphibious as a trait and that's it, you know, swim yeah. speed. Uh, it's so <laughs> easy to do. Those are as, as many options nearly as are you know, on the surface that are available to you. Obviously not with all the books, but you know, it's that is a good array of options. You have uh, all different kinds of archetypes involved. You can have vast undersea kingdoms and explorations and coral dungeons, expeditions to deep trenches to find, you know, lost ships that have been wrecked and cover things from the surface or, you know, traveling to other aquatic planes to treat with the people that live there or to banish, uh, you know, some sort of aquatic horror back to where it came from. You can do all kinds of things. Nearly everything that you can do on the surface, you can do underneath the waves, but it's it's got that added alienness to it. It's got the fact, what I love about like the ocean is that it's all connected. You step into it and you're immediately connected through the water to just about anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not like, say, the land where there's 
you know, you're, you're bound to the surface, right? It's terrestrial. Whereas underwater, you're swimming, it's, it's three-dimensional. The, the places that you can visit, the things that you can do are more expansive. In that sense, it like really inspires me to do something new and interesting and, and different mm -hmm. uh, with these uh, creatures, as opposed to just like tacking them onto a setting and being like, oh yeah, there's a whole civilization of underwater people out there. And then like, you never talk about it. It does not really matter what yeah. you pick. Right. You're probably going to be just fine. You're probably going to be just fine. You can imagine them being uh, friends with, like, say, Water Ganassi mm -hmm. uh, and, and the two of them. Or even just, like, Tritons are another type of elemental humanoid. You know, they're, they just are. And maybe they're more water than, than uh, you know, um, flesh. <laughs> uh, or maybe they are more like fish people and they, you, you give them, like, full-on gills and, you know, bug eyes and fins. And they look way more, like, deep ones. Uh, or something than they do. Yeah, look closer to Sahagwan than, right, yeah. Yeah, than human. Those are the ways I'd be either reskin them or sort of use them conceptually. But um, yeah, like I said, the more I talk about it, the more I want to just write this up. <laughs> yeah, no, most definitely. <laughs> well, in order to prep, you're going to have to know all of their abilities. Yes. So uh, let's start running down. We already mentioned it, but like getting that plus one to strength con and charisma. Right. I mean, that's just a, that's a good array of yeah. abilities. I mean, health, might, and uh, appeal. I yeah. mean, that's, you know, you're ready for the cover of a magazine. Right, right. Fabio. <laughs> he was a triton. <laughs> I like the, the stat distribution there. Uh, swim speed, amphibious, obviously required for uh, creatures that are going to operate underwater. Mm -hmm. But it's the, like, controlling air and water ability, like, sort of, like, their innate magic yeah, yeah. about it that, to me, says they maybe are, are partially elemental themselves, obviously from the planes, you know. Right off the bat, being able to cast Fog Cloud once a day, third level, you get Gust of Wind once a day, and then Wall of Water at fifth level. Yeah. Now, question, Jim, yeah, yeah. and this is purely, has nothing to do with a character that I've made, no, no, but... Fog cloud and gust of wind. Are those just above water abilities or, or, or do you use those, can you use those under the sea? I mean, I would say by their definition, fog cloud's probably not going to be useful under the sea because fog is just like what, vaporized water. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's it, you know, but you could say it, their, it, the ability is mastery of air and water, control of air and water. So fog cloud might be just a, you summon like millions of tiny bubbles around you that obscure sight and you just keep, they just keep generating them and they dissipate or float to the surface but in that localized area it sort of creates this um, you know confusing whatever I, you know you can see this in our own world like dolphins that uh, round up fish by like either uh, flapping their tails to sort of create a lot of bubbles and confusion or like disturbing the bottom of uh, the seafloor to kind of create uh, limited visibility and trap fish yeah. um, it could also be like ink cloud yeah. where you it was like a squirt of just sort of ink that <laughs> uh, you know that fills the water and and sort of obscures things for the minute or it could even just be like you stirring up the dust of the, uh, the seafloor of the seafloor and bringing it up to wherever it is that you are it, same stats wouldn't change anything about it but you would allow it definitely allow it yeah it would it's not going to be a cloud of fog it's going to be something else in gust of wind what about that a gust of wind is the same thing it can either be like you're summoning a bunch of air underwater and it's and it forces the water out of the way and and creates the same kind of situation like just like a jet of water it could be just like a jet of water where it's not even air at all and you just like are shooting out a, a stream of water like a you know like a pool or something all right that's all i need to know <laughs> i'm out oh, oh sorry <laughs> i'll see you next sunday i mean this is the way it is with like all kinds of, of spells i mean you just like briefly digress on that in that Spells will obviously operate differently underwater, especially those that summon uh, energies that are incompatible with being submerged. I'm thinking specifically of like, say, fire and lightning. But, you know, perhaps it's one of those things where like thunder damage is increased underwater because sound travels better through water than it does, say, air. Mm -hmm. Or fire doesn't create, uh, fire spells don't create fire, they create hyperboiled water. They cavitate the water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it like flash, you know, it flash boils it so much that it just creates a localized pocket of steam that that scalds you and then the, uh, the superheated water around it rushes in mm -hmm. to uh, fill that vacuum and that's what's well, yeah, well see to me technically though that would be like thunder damage because that's what the mantis shrimp does <laughs> yeah, with yeah. its little it can it creates sonic booms mm -hmm. with its little claws yeah. that just yeah, knock, that, stun, that stuns knock. and knocks things out use your common sense uh, in prior edition something like a lightning bolt turned from like a, a you know a bolt of lightning that you shoot out to a 
uh, an AOE fireball that does electricity and you take the damage, like centered on you. You're touching the water too. You're touching the water too. <laughs> Unless you're not. <laughs> but if you're, say, an evoker and can sculpt spells, then maybe you can still control that kind of energy and not, you know, get yourself uh, caught up in all of it, even if you change the way that those damage types work underwater. Honestly, in this one, it's common sense. And the fact that the D&D spells already give you everything you need to know to reskin them, they tell you what saves to use, they give you the parameters of the spell, and then it's up to you as the DM or player to be like, this is what it looks like underwater, or, or this is like the specific version that my character casts because they're from an underwater people. I cast Thunderball. <laughs> I'm not gonna sing this song, I promise. Moving on to um, Emissary of the Sea. Yeah. Oh, you can't, you know, talk to fish. No. Nah. You can kind of talk to them. You can talk to them in the same way that like a forest gnome can talk to critters. Right. You know, and, and I think it's, this is one of those where I will play this one probably as more powerful than it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for one, what does a fish know? I wouldn't be talking to fish. I'd probably be talking to dolphins and octopi. And those under the sea know the smarter sure, creatures. Yeah, I'm not going to talk to little guppies and minnows and things like yeah. that. Come on, come on. Was there a big boom lately? That's about all. That's, was there a loud noise? Mm hmm, mm hmm. That's about it. Thanks, Nemo. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> your, your parents are over there. The Emissary of the Sea ability, I probably would play up as more powerful than it is. As a ribbon ability, the ability to talk to just sort of animals and, and the like is not going to break your game, particularly if you're cognizant of sort of like which animals are intelligent, which animals are, are maybe beyond intelligent and actually sort of like willing to converse and mm -hmm. able to. Uh, they're not just dumb animals. They're just sitting around waiting for somebody that will actually <laughs> talk to them. It's role-playing opportunity. Anytime there's a chance to facilitate communication in the game world, Right, whether it's a character knowing a language, a character, uh, you know, having an audience with an NPC that they'd like to talk to, I would rather lean on the side of giving them too much information, having the avenues of communication be too open than too restrictive. And so I'd rather say, like, yeah, you can just talk to aquatic creatures down here because that leaves the door open for me to, like, pass on information that the party might need to know in an organic manner that doesn't feel forced. Mm -hmm. It's a way to, like, learn more about the setting if the player wants to and, and you know, it's an option available to them. And if it's more expansive, then it's uh, more likely to be used. Moving on to kind of their last ability here, Guardians of the Depths. Yeah which I think this completely makes sense. Uh -huh. I mean, having cold resistance, it's, yep. it's cold down there, and uh, the rigors of, of deep water, the pressure and everything, don't get to them. Which, you know, it also accounts for their plus one strength. Certainly you know does. what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and their constitution. It's the, like, I like how these, like, to me, all of these abilities really feel yes. tied yeah. to their environment. Like, this is exactly how they would evolve. Acknowledging all of that, what, what are your thoughts like bringing one of these characters to the surface? Uh, of like, yeah, you're far inland, you're not anywhere near uh, the water. Now, hopefully, you know, whatever, Ghost of Salt Marsh, whenever it uh, is out, will give you an opportunity to play something like this uh, if you haven't. But if you're playing, like, say, a traditional game of Dungeons and & Dragons and it doesn't feature water features that much, like, what do you, how does your Triton get on land? See, what I, are they doing running about? Well, uh, I hate to keep going back to it since we just watched it, <laughs> but I mean, not every place used to be land, oh, right? right? In your world, some places might have used, they, they at one point, there was a sea there. Whether it's they're questing for an object of power or uh, an ancestral homeland mm -hmm. or a family heirloom, like, oh, my ancestors are from these mountains back, uh, you know, a thousand years ago when this was an ocean and I have to recover their signet ring. And maybe you were given something in a will and it requires the signet ring to un unlock the box. But it's like, oh yeah, by the way, it's uh, great grandma uh, back in the mountains. Yeah. Yeah, it's over there. This is where I would probably do a Triton Far Traveler as a background. Yes. Like, yeah. you are you are a long way from home, and your background is the way that, like, people are going to look at you and you're, if you're doing the kind of greenish or bluish tinted skin, you yeah. know, whether you have gills or not, mm -hmm. you get dry out. If you're outside, it's like, oh, he's got to go jump in the river every couple days. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I would play that up. Like, yes. I'm more comfortable in the water. Yeah. He's always... Always taking baths. Always taking baths. <laughs> uh, if there's a river, we get to a town, first thing I'm doing, checking in the inn, jumping in the river. Yeah. But play those things up like that. I mean, yeah. you know, you're, you're a fish out of water, but you don't need to stay in the water. I like that idea, especially the Far Traveler, uh, because Far Traveler has those interesting features that kind of like reinforces the the otherworldliness right. uh, of certain peoples and like gives you that opportunity to play an emissary or something like that. Along those lines, I might do like Lore Bard and combine it with either Sage or the Anthropologist background from Tomb of, Annihil Tomb of Annihilation and now 
the Triton is more of a Marco Polo figure or an explorer type and they've got some magic so that they can you know use and I'd probably go lean really heavily into the water spells uh, for that and mostly though they are there to to uh, fix the ignorance that Triton society has about the surface world. And so they are there as like, yeah, I'm, I'm here to learn as much as I can. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm part of, say, maybe I'm part of an official diplomatic mission, mm-hmm. you know, or maybe I'm just on my own. You know, it's your job to, like, introduce yourselves to the various courts of the land. What do they know? What do they know about us? Are they friendly? Would they be willing to trade? Are they, is there a place for us on the surface? Is there a place for them underneath the waves? That might be the character that I play and you're sort of like there as a, a goodwill ambassador to this newly discovered uh, peoples yeah. or something like that. See, I can see, I can see it that way, or you play it that way mm-hmm. externally, but you are the first scout mm. in the coming conquest. <laughs> yes. Go up there, find out as much as you can about uh, them. Yeah. See if they'd be willing to, you Maybe know. that's oh. like the sinister secret in your background. Exactly. You're, you're just like a cat's paw and, and, and it's like, okay, they picked you because you're naive and trusting and have a curiosity about the world and, and what's above it. People back home, no, they're not interested in any of the things they say they are. They are interested yeah. in something else. Actually, yeah, that's even more interesting if yeah. you're the secret like, cat's paw. Mm-hmm. And so through adventuring, somebody for like, uh, it actually it looks like they're forming for war and you're right. you're with them yeah like, it's like yeah oh, well they wouldn't right. they wouldn't do that yeah, you know and yeah. then you get to have the you against your own people thing uh, what i love the most about tridents is the conceptual ground that they open up yeah. and and the fact that underwater adventures and underwater fantasy locations are pardon the pun you know unexplored depths <laughs> of mm-hmm. uh of gaming and um, you know, for this crusty old barnacled gamer like myself, mm-hmm. uh, it's the new and novel that uh, really draws to me. Yes, let the oceans <laughs> oh, scrub away all of the rough surfaces, yes. like the stone. Just like the stone, let the ocean envelop you. Every yeah. crevice, Thank you, every fold, the warm enveloping embrace of the ocean. Mm. Mm. So yes. erotic. <laughs> we already did romance, Jim. Okay. So erotic, um, so wet. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. If you need more WebDM talk, we've got a podcast and a whole lot more on our Patreon. We just talked to Wolfgang Bauer, the head of Cobalt Press, about D&D, his career, and more. It's available free, so download it now. Oh, and he gave our patrons a huge discount on some great stuff, too. Link here and in the description. Okay, are we done now?